We're here to talk with Dr. Till Runenberg, who is known as the, not the inventor of because it existed, but the, the guy who indent, identified social jet lag. Why don't you just explain what you do, and then we're going to have a discussion, not so much about sleep, but about circadian rhythms. So. Well, first of all, I have to contradict, I'm not the most sleeping scientist in the world. Um, <laughs> I, but I, I, I did study the circadian clock, which is our body clock, for about 40 to 45 years, starting when I was 17, um, to work with one of the pioneers of the field that was Jürgen Aschoff in Erling Andex. Um, I've investigated this phenomenon mostly in the lab until about 10 years ago, I realized that the real challenge in the real lab is the out. Is, is the real world, and that the best, the best hamster um, ever to be created as a, as a scientific model system is the human, because you can do things with human by asking them, um, for example, questions that you can't do with hamsters. Um, and that's why I went outside of the lab, studied circadian rhythms um, in, meanwhile, epi on the epidemiology, epidemiological scale, about 150,000 people were gathering more and more. And those big numbers gave us the possibility to look at the phenomenon of the clock in real life. And one of the things we discovered was this huge discrepancy between what your body clock wants and what your social clock or your work times or your boss wants. And that's why we came up with the term social jet lag, because what these people are doing is they're living in two time zones, and one is during the work week, and one is on the weekends. And you can see that, and they're sort of flying to and fro, and um, with a lot of consequences for their health and performance. Okay, and the title of the book? Um, and the book was called Internal Time, or in German, Wie wir ticken, and it's all about how humans and their clocks have to interact with the, the world outside. Great, thank you. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a conversation. We may, at the end, if somebody starts jumping up and down and wakes us up, have audience questions, but we have only about 16 minutes left, so we're going to try and be pretty brief. Just to set the stage, I'm not a scientist. I've gotten very interested in the circadian rhythm because I have a lot of actual jet lag. I travel a lot. Uh, I'm one of the early risers. And 23andMe at least says that your circadian rhythm is partly determined by genetics, which seems plausible. I have this theory that I'd like to ask you. It seems to me that some people so internal clock is shorter than 24 hours and other people's is longer and that's sort of the big divide between the so-called morning and evening people. Would you? Um, every clo the clock of every healthy person has exactly 24 hours. Exactly. exactly. Other otherwise, they would be running out of phase because if my clock was longer than 24 hours, I would, my, it would be later every day. Right, and that's what morning... No, and no, no, no. They're all synchronized to 24 hours. But what if you put them in a dark room for three days? What happens? If you put them into the dark room for three days, you will get a lot of trouble with the ethics committee because with humans, <laughs> you are not allowed to put them into darkness for three days. But you okay. can put them into a bunker, mm -hmm. an isolation chamber. Yeah. And, um, and then they will display their own rhythm. But nobody says that that is the underlying mechanism, that somebody who shows a 25-hour rhythm in temporal isolation actually has an underlying 25-hour rhythm, but that his whole mechanism creates a 25-hour rhythm in the isolation. But this mechanism also creates a perfect 24-hour rhythm in non-isolation, but you are correct. There are people who are earlier or later, but they're not two groups. It's like body height. It's like saying they're, they're, they're early, early types or morning types and evening types is like talking about dwarfs and giants. They're the, 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 the end tail of a, of a Gaussian distribution, and we, as in body height, we have everything in between. Okay. It's a real biological phenomena. It depends on your genetic disposition, on your sex, on your age, 
and on your light exposure. And that's probably why you're wearing light in your ears. My Valkyries. I'll, I'll talk about those in a moment. But I just want to ask, how many of you are morning people? And how many of you are night people? And of course, this isn't a representative sample because it's in the morning. Yes, and, and many people who think, who, who think they are evening people are actually um, not, not as, as evening as, as most of the real evening people are. So anybody who can, who can start um, writing up the income tax declaration at 2 o'clock in the morning, hands up. See, those are the real... Late, late people. Anybody who can start writing the income tax declaration at four o'clock in the morning? Those are the real early types. And in between, you have the rest. Okay. So, um, yeah, we, we had this discussion earlier. What I'm wearing in my ears are Valky ear lights. And they're from Finland. The theory is you have photosensitive proteins in your brain. And you can readjust your circadian rhythm with light, as you mentioned. You can also deal with seasonal affective disorder, which is the depression people get from lack of light in the winter, which maybe you want to talk a little bit about how light regulates their circadian rhythm in people. Um, there are certain light receptors in our eyes, actually. But there's also photosensitive proteins in your brain. This is an argument. We'll leave it at that. Um, uh, I'm very skeptical, but me. I don't care. As yeah. long as it helps you, yeah. it's fine. It, <laughs> <laughs> it helped my mother, and, who and didn't I, believe I'm in it. I'm a scientist who is actually bored by, by having the feeling science knows everything. So if, you get, uh, uh, if somebody proves that the yeah. light into the ear actually has, a, is, has, a, has an underlying mechanism, I would be thrilled because Good. that would be entirely new. Well, we'll invite you to Finland, okay, where so, they've done scientific so, studies. So the, the trouble is that we don't know very much about light because we're using light to watch the world and not to sense light. Um, our entire system that uses light is geared towards a contrast system so that we can read a, um, a black print on white paper on a glacier in, on a summer's midday and with a candle um, in, in, in the winter. Um, that is accomplished by, by making a lot of adjustments so that I always can ask the question which dot um, is darker and which dot is brighter. This mechanism doesn't care tuppence about how much light there actually is. However, other systems in our brain who are connected to our clock, to sleep, to our um, psychological state, um, want to know how much light there is, and we have special light receptors who can actually integrate light over the course of a day, and therefore tell the brain, um, this is a summer's day, or this is a winter's day. Now, since we all of us modern people live in buildings nowadays, our brains are always told, this is a winter's day, because we hardly ever get light. Um, in here, if you're lucky, depending on where you're sitting, you get about 100 lux maybe less. If you go outside today and you've seen the cloud cover today, you get 10,000 lux. Um, if the cloud cover dis disappears, you get 100,000 lux or more. There are huge differences which we don't notice because we think we can read. So do we, as a society, have sort of a perpetual seasonal affective disorder because of lack of light? Uh, you've mentioned social jet lag, which is a dis dis yes. dis uh, discrepancy discrepancy between, um, between the internal clock and the, and the um, sun clock even. This discrepancy has gotten larger and larger and larger because what most people do if they don't go outside, if they don't get enough light during the day and enough darkness during the night, then clocks become later, whereas work times have stayed the same. So everybody except for the very early types like you and the four people who do their income tax in the morning, um, um, they move even earlier with lack of light, whereas the rest of the population moves later and later and later. Yeah, but as a overall, it sounds as if we're not getting enough light. Are we more depressed overall as a population? I don't know if we're more depressed, but if we do um, a comparison between depression, suicide, 
alcohol consumption between the equator and the, the, and the yeah. poles, there's a huge gradient, especially in the winter, um, towards the north where you get, uh, or the or south, the south. Or the south okay. on the south, southern hemisphere, where you get longer and longer and longer nights. Right. So um, depression rates, um, suicide rates are much higher in Norway than they are in Italy. Um, and um, despite of the good wine, uh, alcohol consumption is also much higher. Right. Um, and another th thing I'm curious about, taking medicines, the, we're, we're now heading towards a world of personalized medicine where you look at somebody's genetics, but the reality is right now we don't even look at somebody's weight. I get the same dose of a medicine as, as you would or some other bigger people in the audience. Uh, they also don't look at timing, and I suspect that the time of day you receive your medicine has a huge impact. So there are two ends to that answer. One is that indeed everything in our body is timed over the course of the day. Even 30% of the genes are not even switched on at certain times of the day, whereas they are switched on at other times of the day. And I always say that the two of us now, and you come from somewhere, and I come from somewhere, um, and our body clocks are, are maybe messed up. I just came from Brazil, so you just came from the States. But we are at this moment, probably in our physiology and biochemistry, we are more akin than you are with yourself in 12 hours. Your entire body changes entirely. And therefore, it is important that if we take drugs that interfere with that biochemistry, that they are timed properly. And now comes the individual timing. You have to know your individual timing to optimize any intervention, but even, even physical exercise. Any intervention which uses the biochemistry of our body, which has a daily rhythm and which is extremely um, individual. So your basic advice is pay attention to this, but you can't give any general advice, which is sort of the whole point. You can't give general advice because we're all, all very different. But I, I, what I'm working on is uh, to uh, an awareness and also of um, that we have applications um, at hand where every doctor and every patient knows exactly his or her internal time. Yeah, so the reality is every doctor and every patient should know. I've got all these different devices. There are now the Zio sleep monitor, the Lark, the Fitbit to some extent. Uh, are you working with any of these companies? Are you doing any studies with, you had a population of 150,000, you're now going to have potentially millions of people generating data every night about their sleep and adding to that information about whether they're getting fatter or thinner, happier or sadder. Uh, this is, an, this is an enormous source of information for scientists. At the moment, I'm still a, um, somebody who is doing this by himself with his own gadgets, because um, as a true scientist, you don't want to go out there and, and, and uh, have a product ready that you don't think is ready. So um, I think we're soon ready to get into touch with, with companies, because I'm not going to build anything. Um, uh, there have to be uh, specialists who load up the data. Right. Um, the data should be somewhere. Um, I have to know the night exposure of you. So how do I do that without giving you an extra thing that measures light? All of these questions have to be answered um, so that we can really predict where your internal clock is. Um, and at the same time, I think we should um, reorganize sleep research. We should get sleep research out, outside of the sleep lab. We should create something which I would like to call a human sleep the, the human sleep project, um, mm -hmm. akin to the, the, the human genome, genome project, project, where lots of different sleep researchers, plus people who can upload stuff, okay. um, create a, um, a consortium where now we can watch sleep in millions of people. So I should talk with you later on behalf of 23andMe and, and some of these sleep companies. Any sleep volunteers out here? Everybody's a sleep volunteer. <laughs> So, do you have some advice for them, like skip the parties tonight, or...? Um, no, never skip parties, because social life is ev sometimes even more important than sleeping. Um, especially if you're still in your reproductive age. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best line of this conference yet. Thank you. Uh, some questions from the audience. This has been fascinating, and it could go on 
much longer, but I do want to, yeah, go ahead. We'll, we'll be quick. No, it's in German and, and last year it was in, um, in a, came out in America, Harvard University Press. Internal time, it's called. And uh, does it basically tell you how you can analyze your, your own clock or have you not gotten there yet? I have gotten there yet, but I'm not telling it to the public yet. <laughs> then he's going to start a company and start charging you. Um, but this concept of two-phase sleep that has suddenly become visible in the public press. Should we all go to sleep for four hours, stay awake for an hour, and then sleep another four hours? Um, basically, I've just come back from Brazil where I, where I look at people who don't even have electricity. And um, the first data I've seen make me believe, believe that the way we look at our sleep is complete bogus. Because what we look at is what we are used to. And what we are used to is recovery sleep every night we, because we all don't get enough. So all of the sleep we know, we know how recovery sleep feels like. But none of us have, an, have, have a notion of what real sleep feels like. And I'm saying this because in real sleep, waking up, being awake for a bit, and then falling back to sleep is not a big deal. That's what I do all the time, actually. And I usually get eight hours, so... Is that good? It's like your ear things. If you feel good about it, it's good. But somebody here does well, four but hours that, and feels good. Let's put it this way. You can't, you can't oversleep. You can overeat, mm -hmm. but you can't oversleep. If you've slept enough and I put you down into a, into a dark room, you won't fall asleep. So you right. can't oversleep. Yeah, I get onto airplanes and the airplane goes off and half the people fall asleep, which to me is a very bad sign. They're all sleep deprived, as yeah. everybody else here is too, Let's for, for different out. reasons. We're going to turn out the lights now. I want you all to think calm, soothing thoughts, and we're going to see who falls asleep. Then we're going to secretly Did you say turn up the lights. Turn out. Uh, turn out. Turn out. Yeah. And who who would go to sleep right now if we turned out the lights? Raise your hands. Why do you think most professors fall asleep in slideshows when they get stuck? Because they're, they're sleep deprived. Actually, I think they're already asleep, which is why they're not raising their hands. <laughs> okay. Uh, unfortunately, we have to go, and we are we're very conscious of time, so we're going to end on time. But we want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Read his book. And then uh, when he starts a company to give you the advice you want, buy the advice. Thank you very much, Dr. Renenberg. <laughs>